Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so this SEA Day of Learning is dedicated in honor of the community selfless medical professionals. So thank you for all that you're doing, and may the learning merit the refuah shilema of one of the founders of the SEA, Stanley Chira, Shilomo bin Shoshana, and all those who have fallen Ill, Ill to the coronavirus specifically. So today we're gonna talk about a, a troubling topic at a troubling time, and I hope to show you, at least in the beginning of the presentation, that this problem that we'd like to think of as a very theoretical problem is, is actually already becoming very practical. And this is the topic of fair allocation of scarce medical resources and a halakhic approach. So there's, this is a very packed topic. There are very many sources. So this is really going to be an introductory talk, an introductory topic. To really appreciate the breadth and depth of this topic requires a very intensive study of all the chuvot written on this, all the primary sources. So this is just going to be a, a, a rather elementary introduction with, uh, with little practical conclusion, both because I am still not a doctor and I am not a rabbi. But it's just a, a topic that I think will pique everyone's interest, generate discussion, and perhaps when we do hear of things, whether we read about them in the New York Times or some teshuvot that our rabbis perhaps will publish, we will have some context to the teshuvot. So we know that Jewish life is of incredible importance. The Torah teaches us, we should live by the mitzvot. We must be very, very careful to always, always value every single second of life, whether it be a young person or an old person. But there are situations in which society may need to decide who should be saved and who shouldn't. So this is a slide that shows the potential impact of the coronavirus. Um, so if you see where the two red arrows are, those are comparing the coronavirus to the influenza virus. And if you see, even in a very moderate, moderate form where the virus spreads throughout the US, it, the, first col the third column where it says moderate and 5% of the US population will be in infected, there'll be 16 million ill people, 3.2 million outpatient, outpatient visits, 1.3 million number of hospitalized patients, almost a million patients who will be admitted to the ICU, and 80,000 deaths. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, is our health system ready for this even moderate outbreak of the coronavirus? We're not even going to talk about the next category, which is a severe outbreak, outbreak which would affect up to 20% of the population. So this is the health system capacity data, which has been taken from the 2020 American Hospital Association statistics. And as you can see, there are about 70,000 ICU beds. Remember on the last slide, we said that there will be almost a million patients who will need ICU level care. There are 62,000 full featured ventilators. There's approximately 10,000 more in the national stockpile. And there are almost 100,000 ventilators that are not fully featured, but can provide basic function. So let's call that about 200,000 ventilators. Even if ventilators don't become a limiting factor in these limited resources, an additional factor is that all ventilators are managed by respiratory therapists and ICU, ICU trained nurses, which we surely will not have enough of. We already have a shortage and there already is rationing of care. In the US alone, the earliest example of this was the shortage of N95 masks and appropriate equipment for a hospital staff. Many physicians who would change an N95 mask every time they enter or exit a patient's room are now using the same mask for the entire day. Italy has already been directing care and ventilators to those who can benefit the most. South Korea faced a similar problem. They had a hospital bed shortage. Patients were dying at home waiting to be admitted to the hospital. They simply could not provide enough beds. This rapidly growing imbalance between supply and demand for medical resources in many countries, including the United States at home, presents an inherently normative question. How can medical resources be allocated fairly during the coronavirus pandemic? What does the halakha have to offer us in this situation? I'd like to go through three of the most important sources in the halakha, though there are many relevant sources, but I'd like to build with you the foundation for these important discussions. 
The first source can be found in a Mishnah in Masechet Horayot. Masechet Horayot deals primarily with mistakes made by Jewish courts and by Jewish leaders and the atonement sacrifices that they, are brought, that, that they bring as a consequence of these errors, very relevant to the parashiot that we are reading. Since Masechet Horayot deals with these individuals and their positions, it raises important questions about different levels of community membership. The Torah itself distinguishes between peoples of, people of different groups. There are Kohanim, Levim, and Yisraelim. But establishing these different le levels is not merely an issue of who deserves honor, but as this Mishnah will show us, it creates a hierarchy. And the Mishnah states, Ha'ish kodem la'isha lehachayot ulhashiv aveda. A man takes precedence over a woman when it comes to saving lives and returning a lost object. The ha'isha and a woman kodemet le'ish l'chsut l'hotzi'ah mi bet hasheri. A woman takes precedence over a man when it comes to, if there's a scarcity of clothing, and to release someone from jail out of fear that she would be raped. The Mishnah continues, Kohen kodem le Levi, Levi le Israel. Kohen precedes a Levi, a Levi precedes a Israel. Israel precedes a Mamzed, a Mamzed uh, precedes an, a Natin. A Mamzed is a, a bastard, someone who was born out of wedlock, and a Natin is someone who was born of the Gibonites. The Natin le Ged, the Ged le Ived Mishuhrat. Very clearly, the Mishnah states that just like Ha'ish Kodem Laisha Leha Hayot, there is a hierarchy as to who takes precedence when it comes to matters of life and death. The Kohen precedes the Levi, the Levi Le Yisrael, Yisrael the Mamzer. This would seem very applicable to our situation. In a situation in which there are scarce resources and we have to decide who should live, Leha Hayot, this can be a model. The Mishnah continues, Ematai, when does this hierarchy of genealogy apply? Bizman Shekulan Shavin at a time when everybody is equal. Aval, im hayam mamzer talmid hacham bekohen gadol am haaretz, mamzer talmid hacham kodem lekohen gadol am haaretz. However, if you have a mamzer who's a talmid hacham, someone who's lower down on the genealogy hierarchy, but he is a scholarly man, and you have a kohen gadol who you would think is one of the highest people on the genealogy hierarchy, but he's an am haaretz, he's not a learned scholar, the Talmid Hacham takes precedence over the Kohen Gadol. We see two aspects of the hierarchy in this Mishnah. First and foremost, we see the genealogy, but then we see that there's an element of religious scholarship. Rambam in his commentary on the Mishnah makes an interesting point, and he says a king is not mentioned here, but in practice, a king should surely be saved first, regardless of his scholarship or genealogy, because the people need him. There's an element of social utility to this Mishnah that is not in this Mishnah that supersedes the Mishnah. When someone is really needed for society, the social utility, he may come before the other person when it comes to saving lives. There is a value in saving people whom society needs more than others. For example, it would be hard to imagine in our society if the president did not receive an ICU bed in this pandemic. This logic can also be extended to healthcare workers, as we will see later on. Healthcare workers are needed for the hospitals to function to save more people. Perhaps they should come higher up on the hierarchy, regardless of their genealogy, regardless of their Jewish scholarship. While the underlying principle to this Mishnah, that of social utility, can be justified, Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, one of the leading poskim in Israel, who wrote extensively on medical halakha until his passing in 1995, and Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who served as the major posek for American Jewry until his passing in the mid-1980s, and many other rabbis write that it is impossible to apply this hierarchy to our times. First off, we don't really know who Kohanim and Levim are. The Gemara even discusses this concept of not really knowing people's genealogy through the diaspora. Further, the idea that men take precedence over women was likely because men were working in the fields and were more critical to society at that point in time, whereas this level might not be functioning today. Not only that, but the Nishmat Abraham, a very well-known comprehensive sefer on medical halakha, points out that even today, the concept of the Talmid Hacha might not, might not apply. We know the concept of Yiridat Hadorot, that generations going down in scholarship over the years. And because of that, the whole principle of someone becoming of, uh, of someone having the status of a Talmid Hacham, that he is the first person should be saved, 
is not included. And I think today we see there's many different opinions in, in the rabbinic literature, even as to how to handle this pandemic. And there's a, a great degree of Hilul Hashem that's taking place today. And to figure out who exactly is the Talmud Hacham and who is not can be very, very confusing. So while this source does create for us a hierarchy as to who should be saved in situations of lehachayot, life and death, many hachamim, acharonim, who were almost contemporaries, um, say this source is less useful for us. A second source I'd like to discuss is that of a fascinating case in the Masechet Bab of Mitzia'ah. It's a well-known theoretical case of shenayim shehayu mehalechim baderech, two people that were going on the road. And in one of their hands is a jug of water. Now they're in the desert, they're lost, they don't know when they're going to get to civilization, and they are out of resources, except for this jug of water. If the two people split the water, they will both die. It's insufficient to save one of them. However, if one of them drinks this, that person will reach the issue. There's not enough resources to save both of them. There's only enough resources to save one of them. There's a machloket, what should be done? Darash ben Petura. Ben Petura was Doresh. Mutav shiishtu shenehem viyamutu ve'al yir'e echad mehen mebitato shel habero. Better that both of them should drink. They should both split it. Both of them will die. And neither one of them will have to see and experience the death of his friend. Ben Petura takes an egalitarian approach. How can we value one life over another? We can't. Both lives, every second of life is infinite. Therefore, we split the resources, even if it means they will both die, because to decide whose life takes priority is an impossibility. Rabbi Akiva is cholek. Rabbi Akiva argues and says, Rabbi Akiva belimet. He teaches, Your brother should live alongside you. Hayecha kodmin lechaye havercha. Your life takes precedent over your friend's life. The Biakiva takes a more utilitarian approach. If, the, if in fact, like the situation of Ben Petura, both will split the water, then both will die, what have we benefited from this? The Biakiva wants to increase the utility. He wants to say, at least if one person drinks, one person will be saved. This is a source that is, is seemingly relevant for our time where there are limited resources, there may be one ventilator and two patients, just like there's one jug of water for two people lost in the desert, and there's a machloket here between Ben Petura and the Biakiva. Most authorities are posek halacha like the Biakiva, that you give the full resource to one of the patients in order to save him. The problem is, the major limitation of this source is that the water belongs to one of the individuals. Ubiad echad mehen kiton shalmain. Therefore, not only is it not an obligation for this person who owns the jug of water to provide for his friends, if it means that it's gonna sacrifice his own life, but it may even be a suit for him to give away his water and therefore his life. Even if the person who had the water was 100 degrees, was, a, was 100 years old and would die anyway in the next year. Since it's his water, he is obligated to drink the water to preserve his life. He cannot sacrifice his life and give it to someone else. This situation is very different than the situation that many hospitals and physicians will be, placed, will be faced with. While there are people who personally may own ventilators, the standard situation is gonna be that it's a third party ownership. And the hospital has to decide between two patients who should they give the appropriate equipment to. What we can learn from this is in a situation where someone who is in danger owns uh, an N95 or some sort of medical equipment, halakha would require that the owner's life take precedence over the life of others. I don't think in this situation, an individual who owns an N95 is obligated to give his N95 even to physicians and hospital workers. His life takes precedence and because he owns this, it's not his obligation to give it up. There is a machloket as to whether someone can sacrifice his life to save someone else, meaning you may be able to give the N95 to someone else, but you're surely not obligated. Not only that, while ordinarily it is permissible to steal from someone to save your life, in this situation, it would be forbidden to steal this person's jug of water or this person's ventilator or respirator. 
because you're not only stealing physical possessions, you're also stealing this other person's life. I'd like to now transition to the third source that we go through before we start dealing with some practical applications of this. This is Gemara and Masechet Nidarim, Daf Peh. And the Gemara discusses two towns where there's only one water supply that belongs to one of the towns. Ma'ayan shel b'nei There's a well that belongs to the people of a city. What happens if there's limited resources? There's not sufficient water to keep both towns alive. The first scenario the Gemara brings is hayehen v'hayeacherim. If it's that city's life who owns the water or another city, hayehen kodmin l'hayeacherim. Their life takes precedent. They're not required to give up their water to a second town. Behemtam u behemat aherim, their animals and the animals of others, behemtam kodemet le behemat aherim, their animals get water and sustenance before the animals of the other town. Kibisatan u kvisat aherim, if it has to do with laundering, there's only enough water for them to launder or for them to share the water with the other town. Kibisatan kodemet le kvisat aherim. The city who has the water supply takes priority. This fourth case is where it gets really tricky. What happens if there's enough water to supply town A with water for their own sustenance and for them to wash their clothes? Or are they obligated to give up that water to wash their clothes to save the lives of others? The first Tana says, you must share the well water with the other town in order to preserve their life before you go and launder your own clothing. Rabbi Yose argues and says, Because it's your water, you have the right to do your laundry, to clean your clothes, to clean your body, before you go ahead and share your well water with the other town, even if it means their life will be at stake. According to the Biose, the closer town is allowed to use the water not only for drinking, which is a life-saving requirement, but even for laundering. Even if it deprives the neighboring town their water supply and they will die, the Biose says it doesn't matter. Your kivisa comes before. The Ran, a medieval commentator, states the reason they can launder is because laundering constitutes a basic necessity and will involve physical suffering. Because it belongs to you, your physical suffering takes precedent over the lives of others. Now, this is troubling to many hachamin. Rabbi Moshe Tendler, the son-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and Rabbi Abraham Steinberg, who I will quote at the end and bring you uh, snippets of what he wrote, and, and some of his encyclopedia is incredibly useful for this work. They argue that when the Ran mentions that your physical discomfort comes before the other people's life-threatening condition of lack of water, that's because uncleanliness in those times especially can lead to disease and thus a risk of life. We know this from the Gemara, Shemuel, an early Amora and a physician, states that unclean clothes can lead to madness, unclean bodies can lead to boils and such. So they understand the Ran, that the Ran is talking about other people's lives now and your lives in the future. Either way, the critical conclusion of this sugya is that societies must be concerned with future generations. They must be concerned with long-term planning. If this town gives up critical drinking water and uses it instead to let the other town drink and doesn't clean their clothes and doesn't take care of themselves, that can lead to infection in their town and wipe out their entire futures. This town has the right to be concerned for their future generations. While in this case, this too is similar to last case of the Biakiva, where one of the people owned the jug of water, whereas in this case, one of the towns seems to own the well of water, it is different than the last case. In the theoretical case of the Biakiva, only one life could be preserved. That was the presumption. One will live and one will die. It was all vadai. We were all living in a world of certainty in this theoretical case of Dibi Akiva. This one was certainly going to live and this, was, this one was certainly going to die or they were both certainly going to die. 
In our case, it is not at all certain that the lack of laundering will kill. It might kill the community in the future, but there is an outright life-threatening situation to the other town. They have no water. This sugya goes even further than the last sugya. Even in situations where there is no vadai sakana, there's no vadai risk, there's no certain risk to the other people's, to, to your life, but you have a safek sakana. You don't have to relinquish your property, your water, or your medicine to help others, even if they will surely die. Now we have our three Talmudic sources. The first one, the Mishnah from Horayot, showing social util utility. There is value in saving people whom society needs more than others. You can't grow a Talmud Hacham overnight. You can grow a Kohen Gadol overnight. You just teach him how to do the Avodah. We saw from the second source, if you own the treatment, if you own a respirator, you do not have to give it up to save other people. And we saw from this third source, societies must be concerned with their future generations and long-term planning. Now I'd like to talk about these three sources in the context of two practical cases that hospitals may be challenged with. The first case will discuss pa two patients who arrived simultaneously with only enough resources to preserve one of their lives. Imagine a situation where two people arrive to the emergency room and there's only one ICU bed left or only one ventilator left. The second case we will discuss, which is probably more likely, will discuss patients who arrive sequentially. For example, if an older patient arrives now with a very poor prognosis and you get a call that an ambulance is coming with a 40-year-old man who has a really good prognosis but also requires a ventilator, can you avoid giving care to the older person or to the sicker person who's in front of you now to save that ventilator for the younger person who is in route. The first tshuva I'd like to go through is the tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein. He talks about the case if you have two people who present, one relatively healthy, who if he gets the ventilator will definitely live. If he doesn't, he may live, he may not. But you have another person who arrives, and if he doesn't get the ventilator, he will surely die. If he gets the ventilator, he may or may not survive. What happens if you have two people who arrive? You give it to the person who has the greatest chances of benefiting from the, from the treatment. You enter first into the ICU or the room according to the judgment of the doctors that are found there, who they are most capable of healing. This is the tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein who says, if two people come at once who need treatment, you give it to the person with the better prognosis. The next tshuva I'd like to go through is the tshuva of the Sitz Eliezer. The Sitz Eliezer was a, he's called after his sefarim that he wrote. His name is Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg. He was one of the most prolific hachamim on medical halakha. His tshuvot are extremely lengthening. Some exceed over a hundred pages. He passed away relatively recently in the early 2000s. And as someone who really pushed the envelope with publishing on medical halakha, He's published on sex reassignment surgery and many other very novel and complex topics. The Sitz Eliezer writes, The person who has the greater likelihood of surviving for a longer period of time takes precedent. So if you have two people here, and you could get both people through their coronavirus sickness. But one person, let's say has cancer, or let's say has other underlying conditions, and it's likely he's only going to live what you'd call temporarily. According to many post scheme, it's a year, but there's a large discrepancy in the halakhic literature. What is exactly hayesha? But you have another person who, if you get him through his coronavirus uh, disease, he'll have haya olam. He'll live for a much longer time than the other person. Than the other person. You would push off 
the life-saving treatment for the person of the Hayesha, who you're only going to give temporary life to, something that we can consider under a year when there's not enough resources for both of them. From here we learn that it's preferable to give the first treatment to the person who is going to have Haye Olam, a longer life than the person who is going to have Haye Sha'a. These sources are dealing with people who arrive at the same time. According to both Rav Moshe Feinstein and the Sitz Eliezer, you give it to the person, well, according to Rav Moshe Feinstein, you give it to the person who has the greatest chances of benefiting from the treatment, irrespective of whether it's Haye Olam or Haye Sha'a, According to the Sitz Eliezer, you take the future into perspective. You say not only who is going to benefit from this treatment, but who is going to benefit from this treatment in a way that gives them the longer life. Haye Sha'a or Haye Olam. Is it a temporary life or is it going to be a, uh, a, a longer life? These chuvot explicitly mentioned, regardless of the hierarchy we mentioned in Masechet Horayot, regardless of their status of Talmudia Hachamim, Haye Olam, takes pre precedence over Hayesha'a as the most critical factor according to the Sitz Eliezer. What about the second case that we discussed? Not patients arriving at the same time, but patients arriving sequentially. Imagine a situation where an elderly chronic smoker, COPD, heart failure, previous heart attacks presents with COVID-19 and requires a ventilator. You get a call from an ambulance en route that there's a healthy 30-year-old who's having trouble breathing, no previous health history. He's gonna arrive in 30 minutes. There's only one ventilator left. What do you do in this situation? Many rabbis, amongst them Rabbi Benasha Klein, who uh, was a Holocaust survivor, a fascinating background, was a Hasidic Rebbe who also wrote a lot about medical halakha. And alongside him, Rabbi Tendler, who I mentioned is the son-in-law of Rav Moshe Feinstein, says, you treat the people in the order in which they arrive. It doesn't matter that there's someone coming in 30 minutes who has a better prognosis. He's not in front of us. Maybe he'll get rerouted to a different hospital. Who knows what could happen in those 30 minutes? But we do know that there is a person in front of us who needs that care desperately. And if he doesn't get this care that is available right now, he will die. Many hachamim agree with Rabbi Tendler, agree with Rabbi Ben Klein, and hold that you give it to people in the order in which they arrive. The Sitz Eliezer, however, says something different. He says, You have two people. One is going to have Hatzalat Vada'i. You're definitely going to be able to save this person, such as the younger person that I presented in this situation. And the other one is Hatzalat Terefa al Hayesha'a. There's so many comorbidities. There's so many other medical challenges. By giving this, the first person in our case, the ventilator, it's really only going to Hayesha'a, temporarily keeping, keep him alive. Kib Vada'i hadin noten lifsok et halacha ki a terefa ve Hayesha'a nedhe mepene ha Haye olam. In this situation, the terefa and the hayesha'a, the elderly gentleman, even if he arrived first, we would nidhaya his care, we'd push off his care for the hayya'ola. You would be mevatel the first person's care for the other person's eternal care. And it's better in this situation, if shad liyot efo bazeh, you fall under the halachic category of shev ve'al ta'aseh, sit and don't do anything with the person who's only going to have haye sha'ah. Many people, including Rabbi Steinberg and others, understand that this, that this seat silly is, it, is talking about even when the two people are not in front of you at the same time. They will come sequentially and one other person, the person who has a better prognosis, is arriving later. What happens in more practical situations where there are limited ventilators or nursing staffs and models are predicting we will not have the capacity? I'm moving on from the last case where there's someone en route to the hospital who can more benefit from the ventilator and will have a better prognosis. But I'm talking about a situation that we're in currently now, where models are predicting that in New York, the situation will get so bad in a few days or a week, in two weeks, that in the future we will need the ventilator. And there are people presenting now who need them that have poor prognoses. Are you allowed to withhold the ventilators from them for the theoretical future? 
I have not seen this explicitly, but I think not. I think it's very clear from the sources that you would have to treat the person who needs it now, even if he likely won't make it, even though there are theoretical models predicting things that will happen in the future. Perhaps America will take a very serious look at social distancing and will successfully flatten the curve dramatically over a few days. And, uh, and, and, uh, and therefore there will be more ventilators around. For a theoretical future, I don't think anyone would argue that you can prevent giving ventilators to people who are presenting now. However, there is one last important caveat. What happens when we have maxed out our ventilator capacity? And now later in the disease course, younger and healthier patients present who require a ventilator but cannot get one. Patients who have coronavirus are often on ventilators for 10 days to three weeks. That's a very long time to keep someone on a ventilator. And there are younger people who are presenting towards the end of the ventilator course of these older people who anyway have a poor prognosis. Can we take people who will likely have Hayesha'a off the ventilator, stop their ventilator to provide pr for people who will likely have Hayesha'a? This is a question for very serious hachamin, but I could only offer you what has been quoted in the literature. Rav Abraham Steinberg quotes Rav Zilberstein. Rav Zilberstein is the, was the son-in-law of Rav Yashiv. He's one of the leading poskim today in Israel and in the world of medical halakha. He had a very novel idea, and he argued that you can remove someone with a short life expectancy from the ICU, not off of a ventilator, to make room for a potentially curable patient even though this person will now get a lower degree of care and have a higher degree of mortality, you can remove someone with a shorter life expectancy, a hayesha from the ICU, to make room for a, more, for a potentially curable patient. I think Rav Moshe Feinstein would argue on this point, as he had argued, in, as we saw in his tshuva, that this person has acquired his care. This person has acquired his ICU care. Just like the Akiva says that the person who owns the water doesn't give up his water to save others, so too this person who is receiving his ICU level care has as if to say acquired his care and, would, and it, now it's his care and he does not have to give it up. I think Rav Moshe Feinstein would argue, but this is a question for the Hachamim who are really experts in this field. I, so I hope that Mahloket was clear between downgrading someone from ICU care out of ICU care. Rav Zuberstein does mention explicitly that if it will cause this patient to have severe anxiety, that he knows he's being moved out of the ICU, and it will cause him to quicken his death, you should not move that patient on the ICU. But now what happens to the case I asked, in a case where there's a patient already on a ventilator, and this patient will clearly only have Hayesha'a. He's quoted, he's quoted twice on the, on, on, the, on the ventilator already. Very poor prognosis. And now you have this younger person, a healthy person who presents and will have a very positive prognosis if he gets this ventilator. Without the ventilator, he will die. His O2 saturation is extremely low. There's a fascinating tshuva by Rav Moshe Sternbach, a Haredi rabbi who served at the head of the Beit in Yerushalayim for the Edah Haredi. And he offered a novel approach to procure limited resources that are currently being used for a terminally ill patient but are needed for a patient that can have Haye Olam, a permanent life. He says regarding the respirator, you can put a timer on. So at no one point is someone directly disconnecting the ventilator, but the timer would go off, the ventilator would stop functioning, and now we would have to make a reassessment. Who would most benefit from the ventilator? In this situation, while, I will, while Rav Sternbach does not mention this explicitly in our case, he more talks about it with terminal patients who are requesting to die, I think this conclusion can be extended to our case. If you put a timer on the ventilator or the respirator, and now, and now you have to make a new decision who will benefit most from this treatment, you can make the conclusion that no longer is the older patient who's been on the respirator, not only older patient, but the patient with comorbidities and a poor prognosis, he will not benefit as much from the respirator, and therefore you can give the respirator to a younger patient. Perhaps the same concept can be applied here. I just want to share with you a page from Ezekiel Emanuel, who's one of the preeminent bioethicists of the time. And this is a paper taken from JAMA that was published a few days ago. He's the chair of bioethics at Penn, was one of Harvard's first fellows in their bioethics department, which is called the Edmund J. Safra Center for Bioethics. A very prominent family, his brother's Ram Emanuel, who was the, in Chicago for a long time, was chief of staff for Obama. Very interesting history. His father was a member of the Yidgun. Just to read about him is interesting. He is a preeminent bioethicist. And I think if you see the secular approach to this, I think it's more in line with the Jewish approach than people might think. If you look 
ethical values and guiding principles of maximizing benefits to save the most lives. As long as people present at the same time, we should give it to the person who will benefit the most of it, uh, from it, a utilitarian approach. We should save the most lives. We should save the most life years, those people with a maximal prognosis. I think the treat people equally, first come, first served, whereas he concludes in the second column should not be used, is a big dichotomy with Judaism. Because as we saw from, uh, from uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein and the Sitz Eliezer, first come, first serve, I think applies as long as there are, first come, first serve applies as long as there are no other cases in, in the hospital. Whereas people come sequentially, you can give it first come, first serve. I think it should be used in our situation. And then as ventilator capacity becomes maximized and you need to then make further decisions, perhaps we can use the idea of the timer and make reassess the situation every few days. Random selection is not something that appears in the halakha. Should we give priority to the worst off? Should we give priority to the sickest first in the, the last column? Use when it aligns with maximizing benefits. I think halakha would be very in line with that. Should we give it to the youngest first? Use it when it aligns with maximizing benefits, such as preventing the spread of disease. Oh, I skipped the promote and reward, reward instrumental value, and this is retrospective. Give priority to those who have made relevant contributions. Gives priority to research participants and healthcare workers when other factors such as maximizing benefits are equal. I think halakha, and I think the concept from Masechet Horayot can be applied here. So I think I'd just like to conclude, and I hope you've enjoyed this very introductory talk. talk. No conclusion should be reached from this talk. These are really conclusions that have to be dealt with, with the preeminent bioethicists, the preeminent hachamim coming together to decide what is best for us. These are some resources that I think, um, I, I'll try to share these slides if that's possible, but these are some resources if you wanna do further reading and resources that I used in preparing this talk. But I think we saw three fundamental halachic arguments that are crucial to our understanding of this topic. The first one was the Mishnah in Masechet Horayot, which we proved shows the most important factor for there is social utility. There is value in saving people who need, who, whom society needs more than others. That's why we would save the Talmud Hakam. We saw the case of the Biakiva, that if you own the treatment, it's your treatment. You have no right to give it up. It may even be forbidden to give it up. Not only that, but we see societies must be concerned with their future generations and long-term planning from the last source of those people who are allowed to use water to launder their clothing before offering water to save another community's life. And I think we saw a fair application of these in our situations, both by patients who, apply, uh, who appear to the emergency room at the same time, where you'd give the limited resources to the patient who would benefit most, and even in situations where people arrive sequentially. If you know someone else is arriving, like the case of the seats of the Ezid, like a case of a car accident, you know you're getting another patient in the emergency room in 30 minutes who will need this critical resource, I think we've shown that you can wait. But to, to theoretically follow models and curves to say, we know in next week there are going to be more young people who need respirators and ventilators, I don't think it would be appropriate to wait. You would have to treat the older patients in that situation. Not only that, but would you be allowed to then take a, uh, someone who doesn't have great utility, who only has Hayesha off of a ventilator? That's a very difficult topic. It has been discussed. And I think the conclusion, of pros, uh, uh, the conclusion reached by Rav Moshe Sternbach might perhaps be able to be applied today. But these are questions for the hachamim of our generation. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I'll hang around for a few minutes. I know I went a little bit off time and I hope everybody found this useful. Have a great day. And may God grant everybody in this difficult time. Yeah, I see Norman and Danny have questions. So if you want to, un do I have to unmute you? Can you unmute yourself? Is there a host here? Whoever's hosting could help out. No, yeah. For what? Who need who 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 to question? Okay, hold on. Hello? Oh, hi. Yes. So uh, really fantastic talk. Um, I have a quick question that's slightly off. It's a little bit more tangential, not exactly on topic of rationing in the healthcare setting, but more with the shocking source in Nadarin and even the Ron's approach to that. Um, 
now with the questions and the government's trying to deal with this of dealing with the economic health of the country and what that'll mean um, for people's lives, for people's uh, much more future uh, well-being, could that be used also as a way to, as a um, reason not to allocate resources in the hospital? It's a little bit different because it's not as direct, but does that mean that as a society, we have an obligation not to be engaging in so social distancing if it's going to wreck people's lives long term? I think, that's a, I think that's a great question that is very on point. It's something I was discussing with my, my father-in-law the other day. There is an interesting op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that went over some data after the economic disaster of 2008 and the suicide rates in 2009 were through the roof the degrees of alcoholism and addiction, meaning there are unintended consequences to this economic uh, shutdown, which will have not only economic consequences, but life-threatening consequences. People will lose their, lose their lives. People will lose their businesses. You can't imagine what that's like. Go into severe depressions, go and start drinking, and it causes a degree of, a degree of life loss as well, which then becomes re very relevant to our discussion. The difficulty with doing that analysis is that you really have a very difficult time. They're all predictive models, and you're not really dealing with, uh, with, uh, with situations that you have concrete data on. So you're right, the, the Masechet in Nidarim gives a very theoretical situation in which there are absolutes, right? There's only enough water to support this town, or there's only enough water to support this town. But I don't think there's anyone who can say that with, uh, with a definite conclusion in these days, especially when you're trying to predict an economic uh, disaster that's going to take place in two months from now, six months from now. If you think about the information we knew about two weeks ago and what we know now that was so drastic, the problem becomes applying this practically to our situation it becomes difficult. But if you really can have all the data, and I guess parenthetically, this is the major uh, detriment of utilitarianism as a whole. The major problem with utilitarianism is you cannot assess the full utility of a society. To try to say what will, how will we maximize benefit for the most amount of people is a very theoretical system that um, people, uh, people of all different philosophical backgrounds say utilitarianism just cannot be applied constructively. I think your point is well taken. I think the Gimana and Nidarim does show that we are very concerned for the, 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 the well-being of society in the future. Um, regardless of whether it's going to cause some lives to be lost today, but how to apply that, I don't really have a, a good answer for. But these are things that uh, you know public health officials and hachamim do have to take into account when they're putting out these very difficult teshuvot that I don't envy them. They have to write. Hmm. It's a very good point. Um, Danny has a question. Um, so, I just I'm not sure if we addressed it, but just the idea of having two that we could use a ventilator for possibly two or four patients. Is there, are we saying, should we be saying that maybe if one's healthier, then we should just put the settings that's best for the healthier patient and then hope the other patient will get some benefit? Right. So in the case of, in the case of Rabi Akiva, let's say, where we're talking about, there's the Ubiya de Hadmehen Kiton Shomayim, there's water for one person, right? We're talking about, again, in like this philosophical truth that there's absolutely no way both people could, could survive. There's no way they're going to gonna reach a, a well in another mile and they'll both be able to fill up their jugs of water. What you're asking is now, should we split up care? Should we split up one ventilator or so to try to keep four people alive if it will decrease the chances of each of them individually. So if this will, if splitting it between four people will give everyone a 50% shot, shot at survival versus giving it to one person, which will have a 100% chance of survival. This is a, a very, very good question. And it's not something that's addressed directly in our Gimana sources because our Gimana sources are dealing with a Vadai and a, between two cases of Vadai. In the case of Nidarim, some people argue that we're dealing with a Vadai and a Safek, as I had mentioned. That on especially is talking about where, where you're talking about where your life comes before, with the Tanikama would say your their life comes before you washing your clothes, whereas the Biose says your washing your clothes come before their life. That is also a definite situation where they're definitely going to die. We don't have a situation in the primary sources that deal with. You know, what are odds? Is it 100%? Is it 50%? Is it 25%? That's a good question and a long way of saying I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a good question for our Hachami.
Any, there was one other question. Hey. Uh, Joseph, you have a question? Hey, um, in the case of someone that's in the hospital, not healthy, and someone's um, in route that's young and healthy that could be saved and is one ventilator. I think you said, according to Reverend Marshall, I've seen that you have to serve the patient that is in front of you right now, and you can't wait for further, for a patient that in the future that will come. Yeah. Is that first based come, off, sir. first come, first serve. Is that based on the Gimara and Baba Messiah saying that this person's entitled to that one ventilator, this one jug, and it is his, and therefore you can't give it up to someone else? And if so, if I am that patient that is old in the hospital right now, am I allowed to give up my right? to this ventilator and say to save it for someone in the future. Yeah, so Rav Moshe Feinstein understands it, that this person has acquired his care. The first come, first serve. This person shows up in the emergency room. There's one ventilator. He needs it. It becomes his ventilator. Once it becomes his, just like the water belonged to that one individual in the desert, it becomes his and he doesn't, not only does he not have to share it with that person, it may be forbidden for him to share it with another person. That's how Rav Moshe Feinstein understands it. That person has acquired his care, and because of that, he doesn't, he doesn't have to give up his care. It may even be forbidden for him to give up his care. So I saw in the chat box, Jack Malavasadi asks, is there a way we can wean someone off of in Judaism with a timer? That is the approach of Rav Sternberg. There are very, very, very strict criteria of this. Um, and he has, it, it's been, if you want, look at the uh, Rav uh, Steinberg's book. He quotes this, this tshuva as well. Um, I would recommend you take a look at this. There are strict criteria for a terminally ill patient who wishes to die um, to be weaned off of a, a ventilator. There is, there is that concept. Um, anyone else have, I think we're done with the questions and we're kind of out of time. So everyone enjoy the rest of your classes um, for the rest of the day. There are a lot of great classes all over. Thank you for attending. I hope this gave you something to think about and uh, may our learning of Torah be de fois shelema. Stanley Chira, one of the founders of the SCA, who sponsored the day, and Rifuashi of all the people who are sick from the coronavirus and from other illnesses as well. Have a great day.